ان شاء الله ويل ستارت نيميريكال ديسكريبتيف ميجرز فور ابوبوليشن لاست تايم وي توكت اباوت ذا سيم ميجرز اي مين ذا سيم ديسكريبتيف ميجرز فور اسامبل اند وي هاف اوريدي توكت اباوت ذا مين فيريانس اند ستاندرد ديفيشن ذيس ار كولد ستاتستكس بيكوز دي ار كومبيوتد فروم ذا سامبل Here we'll see how can we do the same measures, but for a population, I mean, for the entire data set. So, descriptive statistics described previously in the last two lectures was for a sample. Here, we'll just see how can we compute these measures for the entire population. In this case, the statistics we talked about before are called parameters. And if you remember at the first lecture, we said there is a big uh, difference between the statistics and parameters. The statistic is a value that computed from the sample, but parameter is a value computed from the population. So the important population parameters are population mean, variance, and standard uh, deviation. Let's start with the first one, the mean, or the population mean. As the, the sample mean is defined by the sum of the values divided by the sample size. But here, we have to divide by the population size. So that's the difference between sample mean and sample and population mean. Uh, for the sample mean, we use x bar here we use mu. Greek letter mu. This is pronounced as mu. So mu is the sum of the x values divided by the population size, not the sample size. So it's quite similar to the sample mean. So mu is the population mean, n is the population size, and xi is the ith value of the variable x. Similarly, for the other parameter, which is the variance, the variance there is a, a little difference between the sample and population variance. Here we subtract the population mean instead of the sample mean. So sum of xi minus mu squared, then divide by the population size, capital N, instead of N minus 1. So that's the difference between sample and population variance. <coughs> so again, in the, in the sample variance, we subtracted x bar, here we subtract the mean mm. of the population mu, and then divide by capital N instead of uh, N minus 1. So the computations for the sample and the population mean or variance quite similar. Finally, the population standard deviation is the same as the sample population variance. And here, just take the square root of the population variance. And again, as we did, as we explained before, the standard deviation has the same units as the original unit. So nothing is new. We just extend the sample statistic to the population parameter. And again, the mean is, uh, is denoted by mu, it's a Greek letter. The population variance is denoted by sigma square. And finally, the population standard deviation is denoted by sigma. So that's the numerical descriptive measures, either for a sample or a population. So just summary for these measures. The measures are mean, variance, standard deviation. Population parameters are mu for the mean, sigma squared for variance, and sigma for standard deviation. On the other hand, for the sample statistics, we have x bar for sample mean, s squared for the sample variance, and s is the sample standard deviation. That's sample statistics against population parameters. Any question? Let's move 
the new topic, which is empirical rule. Now, empirical rule is just we have to approximate the variation of data in case of zero shells. I mean, suppose the data is symmetric around the mean. I mean by symmetric around the mean, the mean is the vertical line that splits the data into two halves, one to the right and the other to the left. I mean, the mean, the area to the right of the mean equals 50%, which is the same as the area to the left of the mean. Now suppose or consider the data is bell shape, bell shape, normal or symmetric, so it's not skewed either to the right to the left. So here we assume hey, the data is bell shape. In this scenario, in this case, there is a rule called 68-95-99.7 rule. Number one. Approximate the 68 of the data in a bell shape lies within one standard deviation of the population mean. So this is the first rule, 68% of the data or of the observations lie within a mu minus sigma and a mu plus sigma. That's the meaning of the data in bell shape distribution is within one standard deviation of mean or mu plus or minus sigma. So again, you can say that if the data is normally distributed or if the data is well shared, that is 68% of the data lies within one standard deviation of the mean, either below or above it. So 68% of the data, so this is the first rule, Sixty-eight percent of the data lies between mu minus sigma and <coughs> mu plus sigma. The other rule is approximately ninety-five percent of the data in a bell-shaped distribution lies within two standard deviations of the mean. That means this area covers between minus two sigma and the plus mu plus two sigma. So 95% of the data lies between minus mu two sigma and mu plus two sigma. And finally, approximately 99.7% of the data, it means almost the data, because we are saying 99.7, it means most of the data falls or lies within three standard deviations of the mean. So 99.7% of the data lies between mu minus three sigma and the mu plus three sigma. 68, 95, 99.7 are fixed numbers. Later in chapter six, we will explain in details other uh, coefficients. Maybe, suppose we are, we are interested not in one of these, suppose we are interested in 90% or 80% or 85. This rule just for 68.95.99.7. This rule is called 68.95.99.7 rule. That is, again, 68% of the data lies within one standard deviation of the mean. 95% of the data lies within two standard deviations of the mean. And finally, most of the data falls within three standard deviations of the mean. Let's see how can we use this empirical rule for a specific example. Imagine that the variable math set scores is well shaped. So here we assume that the math set score has symmetric shape, symmetric shape or bell shape. In this case, we can use the previous rule, otherwise we cannot. So assume the math set score is bell shaped, 
with a mean of 500. <coughs> I mean, the population mean is 500, and standard deviation of 90. And let's see how can we apply the empirical rule. So again, math test score has a mean of 500, and standard deviation sigma is 90. Then we can say that 60% of all test takers scored between or 68%, so mu is 500 minus sigma is 90. Mu plus sigma, 500 plus 90. So you can say that 68% or two-thirds of all test takers scored between 410 and 590. So 68% of all test takers who took that exam scored between 14 and 590. That if we assume previously the data is well shaped, otherwise we cannot say that. For the other rule, 95% of all test takers scored between mu is 500 minus 2 times sigma, 500 plus 2 times sigma. So that means 500 minus 180 is 320. 500 plus 180 is 680. So you can say that approximately 95% of all test takers scored between 320 and 680. Finally, you can say that all of the test takers, approximately all, because when, when we are saying 9917, it means 23 is the rest. Just 0.3 is the rest. So you can say approximately all test takers score between mu minus 3 sigma, which is 90 and mu plus 3 sigma. So 500 minus 3 times 90 is 270, so that's 230. 500 plus 270 is 770. So you can say that 99.7% of all test takers scored between 230 and 770. I will give another example just to make sure that you understand the meaning of this rule. Imagine uh, for business statistic goals. For business statistic exam, suppose the scores are bell shaped. Yes. So we have, we are assuming the data is in shape with mean of 75 and standard deviation of 5. Also, let's assume that 100 students took the exam. So we have 100 students. Last year took the exam of business statistics. The mean was 75, standard deviation was 5. And let's see how can we tell about 68% rule. It means that 68% of all the students score between the mu minus sigma, the mu is 75 minus sigma and the mu plus six. So that means 68 students, because we have 100, so you can see 68 students score between 17 and 8. So 60 students out of 100 score between 70 and 8. About 95 students out of 100 score between 75 minus 2 times 5, 75 plus 2 times 5. So that's 
gives 65 the minimum and the maximum is 85. So you can say that around 95, 95 students score between 65 and 85. Finally, maybe you can see all students. Because when you are saying 99.7, it means almost all the students score between 75 minus 3 times 5 and 75 plus 3 times 5. So there are 60 Now let's look carefully at these three intervals. The first one, 7 to 80. The other one, 65 to 85. Then 6 to 90. When we are more confident, when we are more confident here for 99.7%, the interval becomes wider. So this is the widest interval. Because here, the length of the interval is around 10. The other one is 20. Here is 30. So the last interval has the highest width. So as the confidence coefficient increases, the length of the interval becomes comes with larger and larger because it starts with 10, 20, and we end with 30. So that's another example of empirical uh, And again, here we assume the data is belt shape. Let's move to another one when, uh, when the data is not belt shape. I mean, if we have data and that data is not symmetric. We can't use this. So that rule is no longer valid. So we have to use another rule. It's called shape to shape rule. Any question before we move to the next topic? At shape to shape rule, it says that regardless of how the data are distributed, I mean, if the data is not symmetric or not well shaped, then we can say that at least instead of saying 68, 95, or 99.7, just say around 1 minus 1 over k squared, multiply this by 100 of the values will fall within k. So k is number of standard, standard deviations. I mean, number of signals. So if the data is not well shaped, then you can say that approximately at least 1 minus 1 over k squared times 100% of the val values will fall within k standard deviations of the mean. In this case, we assume that k is greater than 1. I mean, you cannot apply this rule if k equals 1. Because if k is 1, then 1 minus 1 is 0. That makes no sense. For this reason, k is above 1 or greater than 1. So this rule is valid only for k greater than 1. So you can say that at least 1 minus 1 over k squared of the data or of the values will fall within k standard deviations. So now, for example, suppose k equal to. When k equal to, we said that 95% of the data falls within two standard deviations. That if the data is well shaped. Now, what's about if the data is not well shaped? We have to use the shape to shape rule. So one minus. 1 over k is 2, so 2, 2, 2 squared, so 1 minus 1 fourth, that gives 3 quarters, <coughs> I mean 75%. So instead of saying 95% of the data lies within one or two standard deviations of the mean, if the data is bell-shaped, 
if the data is not been shared, you have to say that 75% of the data falls within two standard deviations. So for bill share, you are 95% confident that, but here you just 75% confident. Suppose k is 3. Now for k equal 3, we said 99.7% of the data falls within three standard deviations. Now here, if the data is not bell shaped, 1 minus 1 over k squared, 1 minus 1 over 3 squared is 1 ninth. 1 ninth is 0.11. 1 minus 0.11 means 89% of the data. And instead of saying 99.7. So 98, 89, 89% of the data will fall within three standard deviations of the population mean, <coughs> regardless of how the data are distributed around them. So here we have two scenarios. One, if the data is symmetric, which is called empirical rule 68.95.99.7. And the other one is called shaped shape rule. And that regardless of the shape of the data. Excuse me. I said the distribution will not be known. Yes. In this case, you don't know the distribution of the data. And in reality, sometimes the, da the data has unknown distribution. For this reason, we have to use a chip chip questions. That's all for empirical rule and chip chip rule. The next topic is quartile measures. So far, we have discussed central tendency measures, and we have talked about mean, median, more. Then we move to location of variability or spread or dispersion. And we talked about range, variance, and standard deviation. And, <coughs> and we said that outliers affect the mean much more than the median. And also outliers affect the range. Here we'll talk for other measures of the data, which is called quartile measures. Here, actually, we talk about two measures. First one is called first quartile, and the other one is third quartile. So we have two measures, first and third quartile. The quartiles split the rank data into four equal segments. I mean, these measures split the data you have into four equal parts. Q1 has 25% of the data fall below it. I mean, 25% of the values lie be below Q1. So it means 75% of the values above it. So 25 below and 75 above. But you have to be careful that the data is arranged from smallest to largest. So in this case, Q1 is a value that has 25% below it. Now, Q2 is called the median. The median the value in the middle when we arrange the data from smallest to largest. So that means 50% of the data below and also 50% of the data above. The other major is called third quartile. In this case, we have 25% of the data above Q3 and 75% of the data below Q3. So quartiles split the rank data into four equal segments. Q1, 25% to the left. Q2, 50% to the left. Q3, 75% to the left. And 25% to the right. Before we explain how to compute, 
the median and let's see how can we compute first and third quartile. If you remember, when we computed the uh, median, first we locate the position of the median. And we said that the rank of n is odd. n plus 1. Uh, uh, yes, it was n plus 1 divided by 2. This is the <coughs> location of the median, not the value. Sometimes the value may be equal to the location, but most of the time it's not. It's not the case. Now let's see how can we locate uh, the first quartile. The first quartile, after you arrange the data from the smallest to largest, the location is n plus 1 divided by 2. So that's the location of the first quartile. The median, as we mentioned before, is located in the middle. So it makes sense that if n is odd, the location of the median is n plus 1 over 2. Now, for the third quartile position, the location is n plus 1 divided by 4 times 3. So 3 times n plus 1 divided by 4. That's how can we locate q1, q2, and q3. So one more time, the median, the value in the middle, and is located exactly at the position n plus 1 over 2 for the range the data. Q1 is located at n plus 1 divided by 4. Q3 is located at the position 3 times n plus 1 divided by 4. Now, when calculating the rank position, we can use one of these rules. First, <coughs> if the result of the location, I mean, is a whole number, I mean, if it is an integer, then the rank position is the same number. For example, suppose the rank position is 4. So position number 4 is your quartile, either first or third or second quartile. So if the result is a whole number, then it is the rank position to use. Now, if the result is a fractional half, I mean, if the rank position is 2.5, 3.5, 4.5, in this case, average the two corresponding data values. For example, if the rank position is 2.5, so the rank position is 2.5. So take the average of the corresponding values for the rank 2 and 3. So look at the value at rank 2, value at rank 3, and then take the average of the corresponding values. That if the rank position is fractional. So if the result is whole number, just take it as it is. If it is a fractional half, take the corresponding data values and take the average of these two values. Now, if the result is not a whole number or a fractional half, for example, suppose the location is 2.1. So the position is 2, just round, up to the nearest integer. So that's 2. What's about if the position rank is 2.6? Just rank up to 3. So that's 3. So that's the rule you have to follow. If the result is a number, a whole number, I mean integer, fraction and half, or not real number, I mean not whole number, or fraction and half. Look at this specific example. Suppose we have this data. This is ordered array, 11, 12, up to 22. And let's see how can we compute these measures. Look carefully here. <coughs> First, of all, let's compute the median. The median, the value in the middle. How many values we have? There are nine values. So the middle is number five. Nine plus one. One, two, three, four, five. 
So 16, this value is the mean. Now look at the values below the mean. Below the mean. There are four and four below and above the mean. The median. Now let's see how can we compute Q1. The position of Q1, as we mentioned, is n plus 1 divided by 4. So n is 9 plus 1 divided by 4 is 2.5. 2.5 position, it means you have to take the average of the two corresponding values, 2 and 3. So 2 and 3. So 12 plus 13 divided by 2, that gives 12.5. So this is Q1. So Q1 is 12.5. Now what's about Q3? The Q3, the rank position, Q1 was 2.5. Uh, was so Q3 should be Three times that value, because it's three times n plus one over four, that means the right position is 7.5. That means you have to take the average of the seven and eight position. Seven and eight is 18, which is 19.5. So that's Q3, 19.5. So this is a Q3. This value is a Q1. And this value is Q2. Now Q2 is the center. is located in the center because, as we mentioned, four below and four above. Now what's about Q1? The Q1 is not in the center of the entire data. Because Q1, 12.5, so two points below and the others, maybe uh, how many above two, four, six, seven observations above it. So that means Q1 is not center. Also Q3 is not center because two observations above it and seven below it. So that means <coughs> Q1 and Q3 are measures of non-central location, while the median is a measure of central location. But if you just look at the data below the median, just focus on the data below the median. The 12.5 lies exactly in the middle of the data. So 12.5 is the center of the data. I mean, the Q1 is the center of the data below the overall median. The overall median was 16. So the data before 16, the median of the, for this data is 12.5, which is the, median, the first part. Similarly, if you look at the data above Q2, now 19.5 is located in the middle of the data. So Q3 is a measure of center for the data above the data. Make sense? So that's how can we compute first, second, and third at one time. Any questions? Whole number, it means an integer. For example, yeah, exactly, yes. Uh, suppose we have a uh, number of data is seven. Number of observations, we have seven. So the rank position, n plus one divided by two, seven plus one over two is four. Four is mean the whole number, I mean an integer. Then in this case, just use it as it is. Now let's see uh, the benefit or the feature of using Q1 and Q3. Um, so let's move at the entire quartile range or a Q1. Uh, 2.5 is the position. 
So the rank data of the rank data. So take the average of the two corresponding values of this one, which is two and three. So two and three. The average of these two values is 12.5. One more time, 12.5, is not the value. It is the rank position of the first quartile. So in this case, 2.5 take position 2 and 3. The average of these two rank positions, the corresponding one, which are 12 and 13, so 12 for rank for position number 2, 13 for the other one. So the average just divide by 2. That will give 12.5. Next, again, uh, the interquartile range, which is denoted by IQR. Now, IQR is the distance between Q3 and Q1. I mean, the difference between Q3 and Q1 is called the interquartile range. And this one measures the spread in the middle 50% of the data. Because if you imagine that this is Q1 and Q3, IQR is the distance between these two values. Now imagine that we have just this data, which represents 50%. And IQR, the definition is a Q3, so we have just this data, for example. And IQ3 is Q3 minus Q1. It means IQ3 is the maximum minus the minimum of the 50% of the middle data. So it means this is your range, new range. After you excluded 25% to the left of Q1, and also you ignored totally 25% of the data above Q3. So that means you're focused on 50% of the data, and just take the average of these two points, I'm sorry, the distance of these two points, Q3 minus Q1, so it will give the range, but not exactly the range, it's called, sometimes it's called mid-spread range, because mid-spread, because we are talking about middle of the data, 50% of the data, which is located in the middle, so <coughs> do you think in this case, how does actually the data or extreme values, the data below Q1 and data above Q3? That means interquartile range, Q3 minus Q1, is not affected by outliers. Because you ignored the small <coughs> values and the high values. So IQR is not affected by outliers. So in case of outliers, it's better to use I because the range is maximum minus minimum, and as we mentioned before, <coughs> the range is affected by outliers. So IQR is again called the mid spread because it covers the middle 50% of the data. IQR again is a measure of variability that is not influenced or affected by outliers or extreme values. So in the presence of outliers, it's better to use IQR instead of using the range. So again, median and the range are not affected by outliers. So in case of the presence of outliers, we have to use these measures, one as measure of central and the other as measure of spread. So measures like Q1, Q3, and IQR that are not influenced by outliers are called resistant measures. Resistance means in case of outliers, they remain in the same position or approximately in the same position. Because outliers don't affect these measures. I mean, don't affect 
Q1, Q3, and consequently IQR, because IQR is just the distance between Q3 and Q1. So to determine the value of IQR, you have first to compute Q1, Q3, then take the, the difference between these two. So for example, <coughs> suppose we have a data, and that data has Q1 equals 30, and Q3 is 55. Suppose for a data set, that data set has Q1 30, Q3 is 57. The IQR <coughs> or inter range 57 minus 30 is 27. Now, what's the range? The range is maximum for the largest value, which is 17 minus 12. That gives 58. Now, look at the difference between the two ranges. The inter range is 27. The range is 58. There is a big difference between these two values because range depends only on smallest and largest. And these values could be okay. outliers. For this reason, the range value is higher or greater than the interquartile range, which is the, just the distance of the 50% of the middle data. For this reason, it's better to use the range in case of outliers. Make sense? Any question? Five number summary are uh, smallest value, largest value, also first quartile, third quartile, and the median. These five numbers are called five number summary because by using these statistics, smallest, first, median, third, quarter, and largest, you can describe the center, spread, and the shape of the distribution. So by using five number summary, you can tell something about the center of the data, I mean the value in the middle, because the median is the value in the middle, spread, because we can talk about the IQR, which is the range, and also the shape of the data. And let's see, let's move to, to this slide, slide number 50. Let's see how can we construct something called box plot. Box plot. <coughs> box plot can be constructed by using the five number summary. We have smallest value. On the other hand, we have the largest value. Also, we have Q1, the first quartile, the median, and Q3. For symmetric distribution, I mean, if the data is bell-shaped, in this case, the vertical line in the box, which represents the median, should be located in the middle of this box, also in the middle of the entire data. Look careful at this vertical line. This line splits the data into two halves. 25% to the left and 25% to the right. And also this vertical line splits the data into two halves. From the smallest to largest, because there are 50% 50 50 of the observations lie below and 50% lies above. So that means by using box plot, you can tell something about the shape of the uh, distribution. So again, if the data are symmetric around the median, then the box and the central line, this box and central line, are centered between the endpoints. I mean, this vertical line is centered between these two endpoints, between Q1 and Q3. And the whole box plot is centered between the smallest and the largest value. And also the distance between the median and the smallest 
is roughly equal the distance between the median and the largest. So you can tell something about the shape of the distribution by using the Spux Ebla. Now, look at the graph in the middle. Here, median, median are the same. The box plot, we have here the median in the middle of the box, also in the middle of the entire data. So you can see that the distribution of this data is symmetric, or is bell shape. It's normal distribution. On the other hand, if you look here, you will see that the median is not in the center of the box. It's near Q3. So the left tail, I mean the distance between the median and the smallest, this tail is longer than the right tail. In this case, it's called left skewed or skewed to the left, or negative skewness. So if the data is not symmetric, it might be left skewed, I mean the left tail is longer than the right tail, on the other hand, if the median is located near Q1, it means the right tail is longer than the left tail, and it's called positive skewed or right skewed. So for symmetric distribution, the median in the middle. For left or right skewed, the median either is close to the Q3 for skewed distribution to the left, or the median is close to Q1, and the distribution is right skewed or has positive skewness. That's how can we tell spread, center, and the shape by using the box of blood. So center is the value in the middle, the Q2, or the median. Spread is the distance between Q1 and the Q3, so Q3 minus Q1 gives IQR. And finally, you can tell something about the shape of the distribution by just looking at the scatter ebla. Let's look at uh, this example. And suppose we have small data set. And let's see how can we construct the box of In order to construct box of you have to compute Minimum first or smallest value, smallest. largest value. Beside that, you have to compute first and third quartile and also Q2. For this simple example, uh, Q1 is 2, Q3 is 5, and the median is 3. Smallest is 0, largest is 27. Now, be careful here, 27 seems to be an outlier. But so far, we don't explain how can, we, how can we decide if a data value is considered to be an outlier. But at least 27 is a suspected value to be an outlier, it seems to be. Sometimes you are 95% sure that that point is an outlier, but you cannot tell because you have to have a specific rule that can decide if that point is an outlier or not. But at least it makes sense that that point is considered maybe an outlier. But let's see how can we construct <coughs> first the box plot. Again, as we mentioned, the minimum value is 0, the maximum is 27, the Q1 is 2, median is a 3, the Q3 is 5. <coughs> now, if you look at the distance between, does this vertical line lie between the Line in the middle or the center of the box is not exactly. But if you look at this line, vertical line, and the location of this uh, with respect to the minimum and the maximum, you will see that the right tail is much longer than the left tail because it starts from 3 up to 27. And the other one, from 0 to 3, there's a big distance between 3 and 27, comparing to the other one is 0 to 3. 
So it seems to be this is height skewed, so it's not at all symmetric, so because of this value. So maybe by using a maxi plot, you can tell that point is suspected to be an outlier. And it has the very long right tail. So let's see how can we determine if a point is an outlier or not. Sometimes we can use Baxiplot to determine if the point is an outlier or not. The rule is that a value is considered an outlier if it is more than 1.5 times the interquartile range below Q1 or above Q1. Let's explain the meaning of this sentence. First, let's compute something called lower limit. <coughs> lower limit is not the minimum. It's Q1 minus 1.5 IQ. This is the lower limit. So it's 1.5 times IQR below Q1. This is the lower limit. The upper limit Q3 plus 1.5 times IQ. So we computed lower and upper limit by using these rules. Q1 minus 1.5 IQR. So it's 1.5 times IQR below Q1 and 1.5 times IQR above Q3. Now, any value is smaller than the lower limit. or greater than the upper limit, any value smaller than the lower limit and greater than the upper limit is considered to be and out there. This is the rule, how can you tell if the point or data value is out there or not? Just compute lower limit and upper limit. So lower limit Q1 minus 1.5 IQ3, upper limit Q3 plus 1.5, this is a constant. Now let's go back to the previous example, which was, which Q1 was, uh, what's the value of Q1? Q1 was 2, Q3, 5. In order to determine an outlier, you don't need the value of the median. Now, uh, Q3, 5, Q1 is 2, so I Q of is a 3. That's the value of IQ3. Now, lower limit equals 2 minus 1.5 times IQR3, so that's minus 2.5. U3 plus U3 is 3, it's 5, sorry. It's 5 plus 1.5. That gives 9.5. Now, any point or any data value, any data value falls below minus 2.5, I mean smaller than minus 2.5, or greater than 9.5 is an outlier. If you look at the data you have, we have 0 up to 9, so none of these is considered to be an outlier, but what's about 27? 
The 27 is greater than much bigger than actually 9.5. So for that data, 27 is an outlier. So this is the way how can we compute the outlier. For the sample. Another method. This score is another method to determine if that point is an outlier or not. So, so far we have two rules. One by using quartiles, and the other, as we mentioned last time, by using this score. And for these scores, if you remember, any values below lie below minus three and above the three is considered to be an outlier. That's another example. That's another way to figure out if the data is out there or not. You can apply the two rules either for the sample or, or the population. If you have the entire data, you can also determine the out there for the entire data set, even if that data is the population. But most of the time, we select a sample, which is a subset or a portion of that in population. Questions? Any question? Um, about locating outliers. So again, outlier is any value that is above the upper limit or below the lower limit. And also we can use the z-score also to determine if that point is out there or not. Next time, inshallah, we will uh, go over the covariance and the relationship, and I will give some practice problems for chapter three.